Welcome to the Potion Podcast, your raw look at the hospitality industry, brought to you by SHC. This week's episode is proudly sponsored by Bar Green Ellington for all your restaurant and bar needs. Visit bargreen.com for the full portfolio. Welcome to another Principle of Hospitality podcast. It's fantastic to have you listening along. So thanks for tuning in. As always, our next guest really needs no introduction, especially for our Canadian listeners. Sean Sewell is a hospitality professional who is making the industry better through education, training, and marketing. His long list of achievements in everything to do with bars includes Clive's Classic Lounge, uh, his own hospitality concepts, Coalition Craft Co., as well as two podcasts. I'm very jealous he's actually got two podcasts, Post Shift and BC Spirits, all the way in BC, Canada. Hey, Sean, how are you? Good, man. How are you? Good to have me. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. (laughs) (laughs) It's fantastic to have you on, mate, so no dramas at all. Um, As we were speaking about um, before um, and as people will start to hear, obviously, um, you've got an Australian accent and you're living in Canada, so I want to talk about that in a second. Um, And really talk about how you start out in the industry because you have, you know, so much experience. And I know for our North American listeners and Australian listeners, especially, this is going to be a really important podcast to really reflect on and listen to because you've been in the game for such a long time, um, obviously in the bar industry. um, And, you know, it's such a critical point of hospitality moments being created at the moment and, and that being challenged right now in COVID time. So, Let's talk about how you started out, Sean, and then and then we'll get into you know how you came to start to live in BC. Let's go really old school. Um, <laughs> I, I left. I left. I graduated high school in 1997, and over the Christmas break, um, I left home and had to get a job really quickly. So um, during high school, my parents had a landscaping company, like one of the one of the bigger ones in southeast Queensland, mm-hmm. and we would oh, on weekends, me and my brothers would lay anywhere up to like a thousand, 2000 square meters of turf and landscaping down in suburban households, like yeah. every weekend in and out. Mm-hmm. Um, so when I left and I was like, well, this is the experience I have. I, I did well in high school, but I didn't go to university obviously. Mm-hmm. And I got a job in a hotel. I'm not even sure the hotel is still there in Brisbane anymore. It's called, it was called the, um, the Royal Albert hotel. It was up behind the Roma street parklands before they were the Roma street parklands. So we're talking like 1997, 98 when Mm -hmm. the Roma street parklands were still Roma street train yard. And then they did the big development. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was a junior handyman. That's what my job was. I was junior handyman. That was my job, like changing light bulbs and washers and raking the gardens. And one day um, food and beverage director comes down all sweaty and like bothered. And he's like, do you have black and whites? I'm like, yeah, I have black and whites. And he's like, go home and get them. And we all know train systems in Australia are a little bit different to North America. It's like, mm-hmm. you can literally just jump on a train and be half an hour, half an hour and be home. And you yes. live way out of, out of downtown. Mm-hmm. Um, went and got my black and whites, came back to the hotel, did a wedding that night, had a ball. And that was the bug that sort of, that bit me. Like, I'd love to have a romantic story. Like most people like, oh, I'm third generation bartender. And my mom was a wonderful <laughs> cook. All those things are all false. My mom, I'm an eldest of six. And so my mom was a, a a cook that could make food for six people yeah. all that were growing very, very quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that was my bug. And then a couple of years later, I started getting into the cocktail bar scene. Uh, I think 21, I won my first uh, Australian Bartenders Guild competition national title. And sort of it just sort of flowed from there and, I always took an opportunity to like learn as much as I could from a venue then move on to the next venue, learn as much as I could. And I think that's what a lot of young bartenders need to do more often these days is like, Mm -hmm. just suck what you can from a venue and then move on because you're a number to a lot of big venues and why not treat the same way? Mm -hmm. Um, And then I had the opportunity to come to Canada when I was 26 years old. I thought I already knew everything at 26, like 14, 15 years ago. I was like, you're old school at that point. Yeah, I'm I'm top of my game. Um, but coming from Australia um, sort of sets you a tone, I think, genetically mm-hmm. about being competitive but compassionate at yes. the same time. And so I came to Canada when I was 26, and I suppose the rest is relatively history that we're going to talk about during this podcast. 
always always like to talk about how people why people made um moves in their life i think it's really really important and reflective because i've lived in um one, two five different cities now in the last sort of 10 or 10 or 12 years like what what made you want to go to bc was it an opportunity that came up or was it just you thought it would be a good idea it was a girl not my wife but it was another girl (laughs) it's always a girl (laughs) um for me i went to 14 different primary schools growing up wow so like I, I had a transient family. My dad had to move to where the work was. He was a long distance truck driver before we got into the landscaping business. Mm-hmm. And so basically you move where the work is. Yep. And so um, 14 different prim- 14 different schools in 12 years. And two of those schools I went to for three and four years consecutively. Mm-hmm. So you can imagine like the real move around. So for me, uprooting your life and moving on from friends and like basic convenience and like being us- the usual was not really anything different for me mm-hmm. um i worked on morton island for a little bit which is again you rip your whole life up you move to morton island i yeah. did hayman island in the great barrier reef for a while same thing wow. um so, yeah so for me i actually came back from great barrier reef in 2005 late 2005 and i i left for canada in june 2006 mm-hmm. and so for me it was just always this transient sort of mentality um but when i landed in canada i sort of felt like i f- i found a, a home i suppose yeah you know I'm, I'm sure you feel as well as you get older you sort of like you jump around you got your mates and you you go out on the atvs on the weekend when you're a kid or you go clubbing on when you get old enough um but then there was a certain point i think that 25 26 mark that i was like huh i, I could probably stay here yeah yeah, I totally agree. It's 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 really interesting, you know, how people move around, and and I think that's one of the the biggest blessings of hospitality is the fact that you know you can do that and you can use those skills in another venue. It's um, you know, it's a really that's why I love the industry so much, I suppose. Um, <laughs> so so let's talk about BC because um, obviously here in Melbourne, you know, last year we had you know over a hundred days where where you couldn't serve a cocktail to a customer in a store uh, in a bar. And, um, and now luckily, because, you know, we've sort of got our proverbial together here in Victoria, like, um, not many COVID cases going around, we're able to have, you know, bar experiences and hospitality experiences again. Um, but what's the situation like in, in Canada at the moment? Is it, is it feeling positive? Is it feeling troubled? Whereabouts it placed? I think it's a little bit of both mm-hmm. um, on the East coast, Montreal and Toronto, which is, it's about to put in comparison, it's about a six and a half hour flight from where I am to the East coast. So it's relative to Australia's size. Like a lot of people yep. don't understand Australia is as big. Like when I explain to people how big Australia is, you're like, no, it's, it's, it's not that little Island on the Atlas at the very bottom. It's actually substantially sized. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> and so we just got way less people in between the major cities on both coasts um so montreal and toronto are both locked down right now they've had a, a massive outburst in cases uh manitoba which is a, a small smaller province further inland from the east um they've done a full lockdown like no one's even allowed to travel to the province right now wow. um so we're pretty lucky on B- in BC on the far West coast, especially in Victoria, we've had minimal, minimal cases across the board for the province, for the size of the province we are. Mm-hmm. And then the Island that I live on, I know that during the height of COVID, we went six to eight weeks without a case at all on the Island. Right. Uh, so we really locked down mm-hmm. um, and really tightened it up. So I'm, I think we're pretty lucky. So I look at the silver linings always because I got lots of friends on the East Coast and I talk to them on a regular basis and I hear complaints about from Vancouver and West Coast bars. I'm like, dude, these places have been shut down for six weeks again. Like this is yeah. their third yeah. lockdown. Like not the not the second, not the first. Like the third massive lockdown. Mm-hmm. Um, we've been lucky. It's definitely changed. Um, you know, we 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 do mainly two tops now. No no four tops. No six tops. No large parties. Yes. So. I laugh with the team and say, we feel like we're in perpetual Valentine's day. Like it, this is what it feels like is you're perpetually <laughs> like, you know, when Valentine's day rolls around, you're super prepared. Yes. You're ready to go. And there's just two tops, two tops, two tops, mm-hmm. two tops. And like by seven 30, you've cut half the staff because you thought it was going to be busy. Cause you've got 150 on the books. Yes. Of two tops. It's super easy to deal with. So that's what, it, that's what it kind of feels like. It's a perpetual Valentine's day of these two person parties all night long. Mm-hmm. Um, so my team's been really good. I've got a small, tight little team um, that I actually flipped the whole 
the whole team after COVID, um, apart from one of my bartenders, who's my right-hand guy, um, I'm not working too much. Like I'm an hourly staff member. So as a manager, I'm very wary for the hotel's point of view um, to cut my hours back, keep my staff happy, mm-hmm. not be splitting tips, not doing all that sort of stuff. Um, but overall, like we could be worse. And that's, I think that's the way I look at it. Um, I look at that as, as everything in the industry right now is that our industry is the nature of hurdles. Mm-hmm. You know, like every day is a hurdle. Like yes. whether it be your your toilet's plugged or your head chef is pissed because he broke up with his girlfriend um, or your your cooler broke down or your dishwasher came in drunk. Like there's, these are just, an, it's just, it's a bigger hurdle and one that is a industry aspiring. But I feel like as our, in our life, this is what we do. We yes. come into work planned as hell. Like we, we plan a hundred percent of our day yep. in the hopes there's no hurdles, but then there's a hurdle. Mm-hmm. So I, I feel, that's, that's sort of how I feel about COVID and, and that sort of thing is like you, you plan the best you can, but then tomorrow the government could slide down a new ruling that completely knocks out your plans. Yeah. You know, in BC here, like to, to give it a perfect example, like um, the day before New Year's Eve, 28 hours before New Year's Eve, like five o'clock before New Year's Eve, mm-hmm. the government imposed an 8 p.m. lockout. What? 28 hours before we were supposed to do New Year's Eve. So everybody's got their... Everybody's got their New Year's Eve plans done. Wow. Restaurants have prepped for 150 covers yep. um, and they dropped this down. And so I'm like, I, I was in a meeting uh, and my my ops manager for the hotel, sorry, ops manager for the hotel, like, call, like text me. He's like, did you just see this? What the hell happened? And I'm like, I go in, I was like, I don't know. And I'm getting texts from all my kids. All my kids are like, is there a way we can get around this? Is there a, <laughs> we can, is there a loophole? And I'm like, wait a second. I just got to figure out what's going on here. And yeah, they, they, they can't, they said that all restaurants and bars had to stop alcohol service by eight o'clock and be shut by 10. So this was for my little bar, my little cocktail bar in a hotel lobby. I was like, you know what? I, I can, I can, I can spin this. Mm. I can spin this. I did a, I, I turned the music off every hour. I did a countdown on the hour, every hour. Everybody got Prosecco. I was like, 2020, fuck, like, let's just do a countdown every hour and try and break this time continuum. And like, let's get through it. But then on the flip side, <laughs> on the flip side, a lot of restaurants um, were calling reservations and saying, hey, we can't serve alcohol after eight o'clock you want to keep your reservation and while it's great to keep that reservation a lot of people said yes we'll still come and i'm like oh you know from a business point of view like most new year's eve menus run at a a much higher cost yes you're banking on that alcohol to be drunk Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you're you're banking on that booze you're banking on that cocktail you're banking on that bottle of wine Mm -hmm. um for to to complement how cheap you've done this new year's eve menu at or how extravagant you've done this menu at at a price and (laughs) So like up our Vista 18, our 18th floor restaurant in our hotel, um, they did another 70 covers after eight o'clock dry. Wow. And I'm like, and I'm like oh, the staffing and the, the, yeah. And the, sh- and, and the, and the chef labor and the, yeah, yeah. and like all my guys, <laughs> me and my guys are out by 9 PM, which is like, <laughs> everybody was out and we we're like, okay, we're going to go home and drink a bottle of bubbles with my wife and, and count down the new year. But yeah, a lot of restaurants, they did dry service after eight o'clock. But again, it's, it's just one of these hurdles you got to sort of tackle and, and, and move on with. Yeah. What, what's the government logic around in North America, especially in Canada? I've seen it in some in some states in the US as well about this change in alcohol licensing like overnight and, and all of a sudden we're going to go dry from 8 p.m. or, or we're not going to allow, you know, delivery of booze or mm-hmm. like all these things. What is it around alcohol that they're saying to the hospitality industry that, is the reason why they're doing that? Is it because they feel that people are going to convene together, so therefore they don't want to they don't want to promote that? Or what's the deal? So let's preface this all by like the fact that none of us have done this before. Yes. Like, no, like none of us have none of us, none of us have gone through this before. Like mm. on both sides, the government's never gone through it before. They don't know. Like for everybody who complains about the government shutting down stuff, there'd be the same people that would complain about the government ballsing up something and a hundred thousand people getting infected. Yes. Um, I think that alcohol will always and always in most Western cultures be a prohibitive substance. Mm. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter how liberated our governments get, how liberated our society gets. Mm-hmm. Alcohol will always be seen as a prohibitive substance, which is crazy because in Canada, we've legalized cannabis. Yes. And so yeah. cannabis now has a free reign, yet alcohol still has this mm-hmm. sort of this sort of malicious thing. And I think um, that's where it's always going to come down to. Mm-hmm. And I don't necessarily agree with a lot of governments worldwide pitching that restaurants are the the cause. There's no scientific proof of it. Yep. Um, but that being said, we are congregating places and we can be compared to big box stores and your Woolies and that sort of thing. And I understand yep. grocery stores, mm-hmm. but it, it, it is a slight difference in the way of people sitting for an hour and a half, two hours, three hours in the same space yes. than walking around a grocery store. Mm. So I never want to, I never want to, ditch the government in a way of like, you've screwed up. Like sure. On New Year's Eve, I was pissed. Yes, like a lot of, of people were pissed. Like I, yeah. I had a lot of people like texting me going, well, what's going on here? How are we going to deal with this? So on and so forth. But then on the flip side, I'm like, you know what? I always hope in the, in the, 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 the most purest form that the government's always doing what's best for the people that have elected them. Yes, and I know yeah. in this day and age, that's not always the easiest thing to imagine. And, and as an industry, we should push back but also as an industry we need to look inward and understand that we aren't organized enough yeah. as a hospitality industry we aren't organized enough to have a minister for hospitality in the the government yes. you know or there's always specific agendas from every advocacy group that we have mm-hmm. you know whether it be the liquor liquor groups or the restaurant groups that there's this and then every state has one or every province has one in bc in in yeah. canada yeah. You know, so there's never a unified thing. There's always a sort of mini agendas and mini kings on their on their on their um, thrones. Yes. So sort of pushing this agenda of the government. And if I was the government, it's a bunch of yapping chihuahuas underneath my feet, like barking all these different things. There's yeah. no, you know, when we talk about oil and and car manufacturing and all these big groups, there's always only a handful of lobbyists mm. that are lobbying for those groups. Mm-hmm. It's not a bunch of people. Like talk, like putting their words out and putting their their agendas out. The government isn't going to take us seriously. Mm-hmm. I think until we start having a unified voice, mm-hmm. whether it, as a, a real full on combining unity push. Do you think that's always going to be a challenge in an industry which is so diverse? Well, like when you look at like hospitality taking in things like hotels, like you're talking about. Obviously, Clyde's been in a hotel lobby. Um, then you look at tourism you know, the tourism sector, then you look at restaurants, then you look at fast food, like, and, and then obviously bars that all encompasses hospitality. Like, do you think, do you think that probably is at the end of the day, like a minister for hospitality in both our countries might be, might be the thing that can make it a bit easier to move forward. Yeah, I think so. The, the, the thing is one, the government doesn't understand how big we are. Yes. That's the fundamental thing. The government has no idea how big we are because we're an industry of transient employees, mm-hmm. of employees that work one shift every two weeks. Yeah. Of like, uh, do you count that em- that that college kid who comes and washes dishes on a Friday night? Yeah. Once a week or once every two weeks, is he a hospitality employee? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so the diversity is from top to bottom, whether it be a QSR or a hotel. And there's there's multiple tiers in the government that need to recognize this like i can say a lot of dmos like um tourism bodies destination marketing companies and stuff like that, organizations i know from my one in victoria um we don't have a food and beverage representative on that board yeah, there's right. three members there's three members for hotels different size hotels but there's not a designated person in a destination marketing organization that is a food and beverage representative mm-hmm. so when it's that sort of mentality is i i feel as a as a macro organism tourism and hospitality restaurants and bars and cafes and QSRs and stuff are always on the bottom. Yes. You get the hotels first, you've got transport. So let's talk coaches, let's talk airports, this sort of thing. And then restaurants and everything behind. Whereas most people, a lot of people come to our cities for the restaurant scene, especially like you're in Melbourne. Yes. Like mm. people make a decision to go to Melbourne yes. because of the restaurant scene. Yes. Melbourne, Melbourne's a pretty city, mm. but they go there for the food. Yes. Like, <laughs> It's not because of the warm it's weather. Ridiculous. I can tell you that much. Like, <laughs> like uh, there's a certain level of ego when it comes to hotels and transport and all sorts of stuff. Like, oh, yeah. you're coming to stay at my hotel. Yeah, mm-hmm. but you spend like six hours sleeping in it 
when you've gone to like this cafe and this restaurant and this bar and yep. seen this bartender and this like let's be let's be honest and i think the first 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 and foremost the government needs to understand and accept how big we are mm-hmm. we're, we're bigger than the oil like here in canada we're bigger than the oil industry we're bigger than the car manufacturing industry we bring way more money to the gdp every year mm-hmm. yet we still don't get taken as seriously and we don't have the bailout money that these other industries have yeah i think it's a little bit to do with the government's complete like uh i won't say ignorance ignorance is a hard word but like complete non-understanding of our industry and how many people it supports yes and it comes down to that unity in voice and having that that group of people that can bring one voice to the government because mm. then they'll start listening. Yeah, I totally agree. Like if, if you've listened to this podcast um, a couple of weeks ago, you would have heard me talk to um, Andy Hooper, who's the president of Van Pizza. Um, you wouldn't have listened to it yet, Sean, but um, but when this gets released, it's, you'll be able to hear it. Um, and talking about how in, how in uh, the US, the hospitality industry is the second biggest private sector provider of employment. Mm. And so when you talk about, you know, millions upon tens of millions of people being employed in one sector in one country, I mean, that, that pretty much needs you need a consistent voice. And I think, you know, out of this time of COVID, I hope that the governments around the world understand how much, um, and we've talked about it a lot on this show, how, how hospitality is about community. It's not just about a paycheck and, and the community that it actually brings, um, you know, customers every single day, that connection with a barista, connection with a with a bartender um, and, and how that, you know, makes people's lives better. And, and I think we need to make sure that we can, you know, sustain that with, um, with government intervention long-term. Yeah. But I think it's a little bit of, uh, we need to stop infighting in the industry as well. Like you were mentioning like hotels and big restaurants and QSRs and cafes, like the mum and pop shop shouldn't think any less of the, the Danny Myers or the, the, Kellers in the industry, mm-hmm. yes, they've got their own agenda, but that's that's where this voice comes in. It's like, well, you don't get, understand what I'm going through because you're one of the big guys, yes. or yep. you have a chain of pub. So how do you know about my little neighborhood joint? Mm-hmm. Like everyone started somewhere. Yeah, you know, everybody started somewhere. Like you, you read Danny Mai's book and you and you listen to his. Like I, I don't read books too much. I audio books most of the time. Me too. Um, <laughs> but, you, you listen to Danny Myers reading about his story of coming up. Like he started as a ragtag guy. Yes. He's, he's a millionaire now. He's got a whole bunch of restaurants. He does very well for himself, Shake Shack and all that sort of stuff, but he started off small. So it, like we, I think we all need to just to stop for a, a little bit sometimes and like really understand the end goal. And yeah. it's not just about me or you or that favorite cafe down the street. It's about as a whole industry and mm-hmm. us failing is, is, catastrophic not just for the lifers that are in the industry but the, the people who do to rely on us as they're becoming doctors as they're becoming lawyers as they're doing that like the amount of people that I, I i'm on a charity board i'm going off topic a little bit but i'm going on a charity board where i have to read through grants every single week and there's people in medical school that work part-time at a, at a bar or restaurant and they can't mm-hmm. do either right now because yeah. of covid i'm like so we can have the next like next greatest brain surgeon Mm -hmm. who's dishwashing on a on a friday night at a at a coffee club in freaking the valley yes not be able to do that because of like because of the the lack of support from the government and from the industry as a whole yeah no i totally agree let's let's completely change topic a bit i want to talk about bar culture and i've talked about i've talked about this recently with um joshua copel um, in, in the U S um, cause he obviously comes from the bar scene and you mentioned at the start of the podcast, you're talking about serving a lot of two tops all the time. Um, now you're not getting the bigger groups. Um, do you think, you know, this time of COVID is actually going to change, um, bar culture in the long term, or do you think once consumers feel a bit more confident about the virus and, and, um, not being, you know, uh, vaccinations and all those kind of, you know, hopeful things in 2021, that the bar culture will go back to what it was before. I'm kind of hoping for a bit of a reset. Mm-hmm. I'm kind of hoping for a bit of a reset going back to the, and it is romantic and I, I try to look forward instead of looking back, but like mm-hmm. the romanticness of um, the symbiotic relationship between the venue and the guest or mm-hmm. the person and the guest. Um, I think going forward experience is going to be a really big thing. I think gone are the days 
post vaccination, everything of like the massive bar hops, like the, I, I'm not sure when you travel, I, I, I do this is where I, when I travel, I try, if I'm in a town for 48 hours, I'm sure it's all hitting like 15 bars in 48 yes. hours. One drink, one bite, move on. My mm. wife hates it because she gets the pings every time I charge my credit card on her phone. <laughs> and she's like, dude, you've been to seven bars in like five hours. I'm like, yep, I know, I know. I got it. I got still got a few more to hit. Um, <laughs> I think there's going to be a reset to people, like from the consumer point of view, mm. people are going to be thankful to come into your venue and expect an experience, expect, because it may be the only place they go to. Yeah. Like that night, that your venue may be, the only place they go to the once a week, yeah. which goes back to like the, the days of the fifties and sixties where people went out for an experience once a week as a, as a special occasion, a date night with the wife or the partner. And I think that's where it's going to sort of reset because the symbiotic relationship of take and give is going to be there. Yeah. But also I think it resets our industry as operators to really hone in absolutely everything is your music on point. Now, most, most operators are, Oh yeah, I'm good with that. Is your music on point, your uniforms are on point, mm-hmm. the way your staff talk to guests, um, the way your menu looks, all these sort of like finite things, mm-hmm. I think are going to be even more heightened because if people are only going out once a week for that one major experience, that one mm-hmm. date night, your place better be it. Yeah. Your place better be it. 100%. And and I think that's where the change is going to come is it's sort of that reset, which fingers crossed, I'm really hoping for of, of that symbiotic relationship between guest and, and venue, because I think I know when I started in the industry in the late nineties, early two thousands, like especially cocktail culture, people would come in because they heard about it and they were coming in and for like the experience of that, that what you heard about like that, and slowly but surely we've sort of gone to this like and franchise restaurants have sort of bred this of like being everything to everybody yeah. when you're everything to everybody all of a sudden you're nothing to nobody correct um correct. and i think the industry is going to reset that a little bit mm-hmm. and i think that as operators we're going to have to go one step further to really create an experience where people like leave your room just mentally and physically exhausted from how epic everything was yeah do you you think there's a uh do you think there's a concept play for really great bars to to pop up inside people's restaurants and and be part of that sort of collaborative kind of experience moving forward because you know obviously we're seeing that in food delivery at the moment is a you know one kitchen might actually produce brands you know four or five (laughs) different brands now um for delivery um uh to you know to gain more revenue do you think you know bars will look to bigger venues or or even smaller venues that they, you know, have a lot of uh, synergies with in order to, you know, pop up their brands into, into those restaurants. Cause I, uh, and the reason why I ask is I think, and I really want your feedback here is the bar, uh, the bar customer was obviously, you obviously had, you know, singles and couples and groups and celebrations and stuff like that as well. But then you've got this single demographic who would come to a bar in order to meet other singles. Right. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that has probably dropped off because of online dating, you know, coming up the last three to four years and now COVID maybe the, you know, maybe another hit, you know, I just wonder how, how bars are thinking about their revenue moving forward. I think there's no holds barred. Mm. Like I, I think COVID has sped up things that, like we wouldn't be having, if we didn't have COVID last year, we wouldn't be having this sort of conversation now. Yes. We'd be having it in like two to five years. Yeah. Like the, mm-hmm. Bartenders as individuals have bigger brands now because of Instagram and TikTok and, and this sort of thing. So bartenders are starting to become social media and more so than they were before. Like the amount of bartenders, I think with live chats and streams and mm-hmm. doing their own cocktail kits and all this sort of stuff as individuals have a bigger brand mm-hmm. bars are starting to jump on board with it too. And I think this has opened our eyes to where consumers really want to go long-term yep. the cocktail kits at home. Um, I've talked to a lot of um, bars and restaurants about doing QR codes where you scan, flick yep. up to your smartphone and you watch a YouTube video of, Sven Alaming from order V making a freaking cosmopolitan while you're making the cosmopolitan. Yeah. You know? yeah so really like, I think there's no whole bar. And I think romancing the past of what 
we should be in our little boxes mm. is something that's just the detriment of the industry. Would yep. there be a restaurant saying, oh, to go food doesn't really work for my brand? Well, your brand doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, Put pre COVID existed. It doesn't exist anymore. If you're not doing takeout, which was going to become a consumer convenience highlight in the next two to five years, you're missing out on something. And it goes for bars as well. I think right now the industry is looking at itself and we've always sort of shunned new technology. We've always still done Excel spreadsheet stock sheets. Mm -hmm. Like we've done inventory on Excel spreadsheets, regardless of how great the, the apps and everything that are out there. Most of us still do Excel spreadsheets. Let's be honest. Like that's what we do. <laughs> I'm just um, take, so. Exactly. <laughs> you know, so like social media marketing and stuff has never been, some restaurants have done it really, really well. Yeah. They've been outliers on the, the, the majority of restaurants and bars not doing a great job. Mm. And all of a sudden when people are only at home, I think it's really stepped up. Yeah. I think you're going to see a ton of restaurants popping up in bars bars popping up in restaurants, bartenders and chefs popping up in different places. Yeah. I think we haven't seen the height of the the true celebrity chef. Yes. Um, and the celebrity bartender quite yet. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the only difference you're going to see in the next two years on TV and stuff like that is that they're going to be professionals. Yeah. It's not going to be, oh, you're a food stylist that happens to cook okay. Oh, here's a show. You're yeah. going to have professionals. And I think that's going to come from the raw authentic stories that restaurants and bars are telling on social media mm-hmm. that no, your chef doesn't wear makeup in the kitchen. Your mm-hmm. chef is a, a 250 pound bald bloke who makes really good steak. Yes. You know, your, your, your bartender doesn't look bright and perky at 10 AM in the morning. She's still asleep. I'm sorry. Like, I think that raw authentic story on Instagram and social media is pulling away this sort of like false bravado that we've always played in this industry. Yeah. And yeah. this is, I, I've talked about transparency a lot. Like we have the most horrible days as operators. Sometimes like you have a mm. meeting with your accountant or you, again, like your chef is, your chef is angry or something happens. But then as soon as service starts, it's like, did it, did it, did it. Welcome folks. How you doing? Come and grab a seat. I'm having a great day. How are you having a good day? Oh, you want a whiskey salad? No problems at all. You know, and we, we, we mask our feelings, but social media, especially in the last 18 months has pulled that all away. I've yeah. seen chefs upset online. I've seen like really upset about like, whether it be governments or landlords or anything. And I think all of this is leading to, again, that breed of symbiotic relationship, but it's also leading to uh, everybody lean on everybody and not sort of poo pooing anybody's idea. Yes. But yeah, yes. I I'm, I'm looking at a no holds barred industry for the next like two to five years where takeout cocktail kits and QR codes and videos and pop-ups, mm. all this sort of stuff is going to be, ramp it just because people are going to really really want it yeah no i i, I can't agree with you more sean like i'm, I'm thinking like as going back to the celebrity chef kind of barista and and bartender kind of thing like i think social media is definitely at a time now and i really want to hear about how you got your social media presence up because you're you know you're killing it right now um and bec- I, I think those integral people in the business where they be a front of house service manager who's freaking amazing does an amazing you know an amazing service for a guest uh an amazing rock star chef a fantastic bartender who does the best you know whiskey sour or whatnot and a barista who does you know the best the best new age coffee that is happening um i think you're going to see them play as almost resident you know resident djs in a nightclub like they're going to be in a venue for a week or they're going to be in a venue for three months or something like that and they're going to have enough um, social media presence in order to bring a new type of clientele to that particular venue. I think that's going to be really interesting to see and play out. Um, but I want to talk about how you increased, you know, your social media presence, because obviously you're killing it. As I just said, you're on, you know, a lot of different platforms. Obviously we connected on LinkedIn and, and you've been on a couple of my mate shows Clubhouse. and stuff like that as well. And Clubhouse. We, we connected through LinkedIn through Clubhouse. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And you've, and you've been on a couple of my friends' podcasts as well. So like, it's been, it's been an impressive ride. Um, but how, so how have you done that? Has that just been trial and error? Are you focusing on certain things in order to, you know, get your social media sort of um, numbers up, so to speak, Sean? I don't think there's any special key to social media. I think putting out as much content as you can on a daily basis is good. I put about, 
I would say close to 50, 50 something pieces of content out a day. Wow. Um, which, which is a lot. And that's across yeah. all my platforms. That's across LinkedIn and Twitter and Facebook and BC spirits and SHC and the whole shebang. Mm. Um, I think that's the key. I think if you read too much in analytics, that's where it sort of shoots you in the foot a little bit. Right. So right. we were talking about TikTok before, like mm-hmm. we got started mm-hmm. and I've been watching TikTok for about a year and a bit. And I've been watching it, looking at the cocktail videos, seeing what's sort of happening, the mm-hmm. age gap, what's trending. And it was around the start of December that I was starting to see some decent little bartenders. Like they were still kitschy cool um, on the platform. And I'm like, Oh, okay. You know what? Let, let's, let's, let's test this out. Let's, let's do like three or four videos, bang them out. And then I see how it resonates and goes. And I think it was my third or fourth, like serious video on the platform. Got like 500,000 views. Wow. And over a thousand comments and it was an old fashioned video. So Mm -hmm. you can imagine the sort of turmoil that old fashions bring to people's opinions. And I find, I do find that the, on TikTok, especially when you do post cocktail videos, people have a lot of opinions. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Until recently, everybody in Wisconsin hated me um, because. (laughs) Why? Well, there's, so there's a classic old fashioned that you and I know and love like Mm -hmm. bourbon, Mm -hmm. simple bitters, orange peel yeah. in Wisconsin, like only in Wisconsin doesn't happen anywhere else. Just in Wisconsin, the state, they do theirs with brandy and muddled orange and muddled cherries what? and a sugar cube and bitters and like seven dashes of bitters all muddled Ooh. two ounces of brandy and then topped with Sprite or sour soda. What? <laughs> so this is a, this is a classic from pre-prohibition. Um, lots of Germans settled in Wisconsin. Okay. Um, in the 19, 1910s, 1920s, must have been in the 1910s. Uh, Corbell Brandy from Wisconsin released at the Chicago World's Fair. Everybody loved it and fell in love with it. And it's it's got a whole story unto itself. And <laughs> it's crazy because like we go to a bar and we order an old fashioned, you're gonna get an old fashioned money mm-hmm. in this state. They order brandy old fashioned sweet, brandy old fashioned sour, soco old fashioned sweet, soco old fashioned sour, yeah. whiskey old fashioned <laughs> sweet, and it comes with like whether it be Seven Up or Sprite or um, uh, a sour grapefruit soda. This is all legit. I'm legitimately <laughs> telling you the real story right now. Google this after the podcast. <laughs> Fantastic. And yeah. then they garnish it with. I've had olives this week. Olives, what? mushrooms. Mushrooms, like pickled mushrooms and pickled Brussels sprouts as a garnish. This, oh, this, this is blow my mind. <laughs> this is all legit. How would you like so Brussels sprouts? <laughs> this is all legit. All depending on the region they come from in Wisconsin. Like so different parts of Wisconsin do it differently. Yes. And so after my old fashioned video got so much hate, I was like, screw it. I'm going to do a, Wis- I'm going to s- study and research the Wisconsin old fashioned and I'm going to do a Wisconsin old fashioned for everybody in WI. So I did one over the weekend. It blew up again. Right. Um, but for me, social media overall is about being consistent, changing up what you post. Mm-hmm. Um, I do everything from cocktail videos on TikTok, which I never post anywhere else. Yeah. Instagram can be everything from business to personal. Mm-hmm. Um, talking about mental health, my podcast, everything. Uh, SHC, I try and keep to business and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But I think for social media, you, you just got to do it. Yeah. And I'm, I'm a massive Gary Vee fan. Like I'm a huge yeah. Gary Vee fan. Mm-hmm. Um, and he always says document over create. So whether you're a person trying to build a personal brand or you're a restaurateur or you're a chef, Mm -hmm. like you have stuff in your life that you can take photos of. Yeah. You know, like people, people go, well, nobody's going to care about the veggie veggie delivery. I'm like, unless you take the farm where those veggies came from and people go, Ooh, I wonder if they have a farmer's market. Like, yeah, it's a shotgun blast against the wall. Mm -hmm. And one thing will always pierce for someone. Like everybody will always have something pierce that wall for a different reason. 100%. 100%. You know, so I know on TikTok when I do my little like philosophical stuff that I do on my Instagram that resonates really well for my Instagram audience, it doesn't resonate too much. Everybody's like, dance, monkey, dance, make me a freaking cocktail. And so I stick with that. <laughs> so 
Like from zero to almost 30,000 followers on TikTok, I know what resonates with my TikTok fan. But mm. that being said, when I do post those, those little, I posted a, a video on TikTok the other day about um, the negative voice in your head isn't yours. The negative voice in your head is your teacher, your parents, whatever. And you should just nix anyone that's negative in your life out of your life. I don't care if they're a family member or your mom or anything. If your mom and dad don't, ex- don't like understand and respect what you do, yeah. Just don't have them in your life. I know it's really hard and people go, oh, you're a heartless prick. And I'm like, yeah. meh, but I have no negativity. Mm-hmm. And so um, I think for, but then people reached out to me. I was like, this is really, this is really good. Thank you so much for this. I was, I wasn't feeling it. I was like, you know, that two comments on a video, they got like 1500 views compared to a, my white Russian video, which is at like 30,000 views right now with people saying, hey, dude, um, over and over and over again. Um, so I, I, I sort of scream and I think the real root of it all, like, let's get, let's, let's, let's nix this conversation and figure out exactly do it for yourself. Mm-hmm. Don't do anything on social media that for anybody else, doesn't matter about your audience. Doesn't matter. Like, I mean, like do it for yourself mm-hmm. because unless you're doing it to make you happy, whether it be today or next week or the end game of whatever you're posting on social media with this building up your business and stuff mm. at the end of the day, you've built yourself because if you're doing it to put it out there in the world, and I'm sure you feel the same way with podcasts, yeah. there's, there's episodes that resonate. There's episodes that's not. And sometimes you're like, Oh man, like that, that episode took a really long time to like tee up and research and like record and edit and do all this sort of stuff. And then you're like looking at the things going refresh, refresh, refresh people and you're like oh should i be doing this anymore does anyone care yeah. like and then all of a sudden like something else will click or you'll do something different and you you won't even subcon you'll subconsciously not even think about it and it won't register and then all of a sudden you get 1500 listens over 24 hours and you're like oh but what did i do different so yeah. if, i think that's the big thing is i think everything in life as well as social media is anything like anything online has to be for yourself first mm-hmm. everything else is a, as a tertiary or a secondary, uh, motive. Yeah. hundred um, percent. two more questions before I let you go. Excuse me. Um, most important, what do you think, uh, two of the most, two or three of the most important things that business owners can do right now in the, in the bar space or in the restaurant space, if you want to talk about that as well, to stabilize their business right now, if they're in, if they're in sort of in North America, Um, because obviously you, you know, we've just talked about at length, like the challenging times that, that obviously Canada is going through and, and, and everyone, you know, is feeling the same thing about things consistently, uh, consistently changing. Like what are the couple of things that you're doing at the bar that, uh, are making sure that you can stabilize the business, Sean? I think the big one is stop thinking that the past was good. Our industry was broken. This this is a big one. Our industry was broken for a long time. You know, we've seen 90 year old restaurants with huge brand equity that you would assume have paid off a lot of their debts and that sort of thing shutting during this time. Yeah. So let's not, let's not be, let's not be romancing a past that was broken. Mm -hmm. Inclusivity and diversity, our industry broken like a living wage, not so much in Australia, but it's still broken to a degree worldwide. Um let's not romance this sort of this past that we have a huge opportunity to come out of this way better than we went into it. Yeah. And it's been something I've been preaching from the get go. If something wasn't working for your business and you thought you had to hold on to it because your consumer liked it or that guest liked it. Now is an opportunity to fully reset and, and really think about what's coming in the future and consumers have changed in the last 18 months. They're never going to behave the same as they did before. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's the first step is to understand that what you had is gone mm-hmm. and what you, what you strive to have even during before COVID is still gone. Yes. And so it's time to like, stop, take a breath, really take a breath and ask yourself some serious questions. Mm-hmm. Like, is this the industry you want to be in? There's a lot of operators out there that were stuck in this opportunity, stuck in the industry thinking they didn't have a way out. Yeah. So I think there's a, there's a lot of, internal questions we need to really push forward Mm -hmm. to understand that this industry can come out much better is our hiring practices for inclusivity and diversity, a big portion of our life, or we still just hiring inside our little clicks. I'm I'm guilty of it. I'm happy to admit it. Absolutely. I think we all are, you know, we, we trust what we know. Um, 
we trust what we know. We trust our the the click or the circle we run in. But how do we get, bring more people and more diverse and more inclusivity into that? Um, I think this is an opportunity just to look at our costs and see if your rent is the right rent that you should be paying. Because again, you can you can change up and move locations. Mm-hmm. It's just an opportunity to really stop and really think about everything, every line of expense that we have on our PLs. How do we keep our costs down? Um, and it's gonna it's gonna mold a lot more models. Now, I'm not saying every fine dining restaurant should go to a QSR in any way, shape, or form. But is there a way that you can not necessarily have that as big a menu as you had food or wine or anything. Like there's a lot of things to tie in and dial in. And really I think there's an opportunity to stop and look at what consumers are doing because there's a lot of times that we drive ourselves to a point based on what we think people Mm -hmm. want. And we've really got to sort of balance that out with what are the consumers willing to do? Yeah. You know, like is a better to go program um, better. I think, there's going to be massive, this is going to be a different conversation, but a massive delivery app war this year. I think delivery apps this year, there's going to be one person that comes in and goes, I'm going to disrupt the whole freaking thing. I want all the, I want all the restaurants at 10% commission mm-hmm. instead of a third of the restaurants at 30%. There's yeah. going to be someone who's going to do that. It's going to blow up. But I think, I think the the internalization of why we're in the industry, how we can make our industry better is the biggest step out of all of those. And that comes down to expenses, down to how we schedule, how we do our training. Um, I think I've been doing a lot of um, talking about break-even points. There's a lot of rep- operators out there that don't know what their break-even point is. Mm. Like that's a big issue. You know, I, I've talked to a lot that don't know what their cover count is and what their per head spend is. Like right now, I'm praising my staff whenever we have a really good per head spend because- yeah. At the end of the day, I can't do much more to get more bums and seats, but can I get every single cent out of that bum while it's in that seat? It's mm-hmm. way more important to me through education, through tastings, through absolutely everything, through social media marketing, through everything mm-hmm. to to make sure that I'm maximizing the profit because we've got reduced seating. We, we, we are getting those, you can't dine outside your bubble. So you've got twos and fours. So how do you maximize the money that you've got coming in while minimizing the cost it costs to put that out. Yeah. So for me, a lot of my cocktails are a higher prep, quick service. So mm-hmm. I can put out a lot of cocktails real quick at a much higher price point, mm-hmm. but the prep wise is much more in the back end. So mm-hmm. it's a, like a lower labor, but you can bang out more drinks. And I think service standards and systems and how quickly we can put out our food. A lot of restaurants don't run at, um, ticket times, which I find is an incredibly crazy, like mm. three tier ticket times. Like, okay, so if you're doing 12 minutes to 15 minutes, we're at tier one, we're making yeah. money, everybody's happy, yay, 15 to 17, you know, it's a busy night, we're trading water, we're doing okay, guests aren't unhappy, staff aren't unhappy, everybody's sort of just happy right now. Happy. And then tier three, after like 22 minutes, like everybody's pissed. Yeah. Okay. Let, let's tighten that Fine up. Line, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I think it's just looking this inward and, and really understand this industry has been broken for a long time mm-hmm. in, in a lot of regards. And mm-hmm. I honestly think coming out of this industry and thing, and this comes from, goes to staff as well. If you're a staff member and with all the free training that's been given out there, I know bar smarts here in the U S was doing a whole thing. Um, Ananias was doing a whole free thing for, for staff as well. If you haven't done all these free things that were offered to you during COVID when you had nothing to do, Yes. <laughs> you, you have to understand when the rehiring process really starts, it's going to be a very wide pond and a very deep pond. Yes. And operators and owners are going to be able to pick some really great staff mm-hmm. who have epic education and epic um, qualifications mm-hmm. um, over people who have just sort of been skating by. Yeah, exactly. Like, um, yeah, hopefully, hopefully most people, most of the people who listen to both our podcasts haven't been sleeping during this time, Sean. So, with, um, oh, geez, I hope not. Fingers crossed. <laughs> uh, my last question to you, my friend, is: What are you looking forward to most in 2021? I'm ho- I'm, I'm looking forward to the opportunities. I, I've I, I I saw the end of 2020. Don't wrong. I've had my down. I, I think everybody has. Everybody's like been like, oh, why am I doing this? Is, yeah. And I think there's entrepreneurship life in general. But it's just been, and I, I talked about this to someone else the other day, hospitality entrepreneurship is like this extra level of crap you have to sort of dig through. It's like, I'm an entrepreneur. Awesome. Are you in the tech sector? No, I'm in hospitality. It's like, oh, oh. okay. 
<laughs> but I, I think I think uh, the opportunities are epic. I think there's a lot of opportunities to help our industry. And yeah. so for me, um, while it is a, it can take up a lot of time, um, helping out people, mentoring a ton, um, and sort of giving some equilibrium to the industry is uh, a huge focus of mine um, for 2021. And just the opportunities, there's a lot of opportunities that if you're uh, clever and doing it for the right reasons for the industry, not money. Yes. Um, I, I've seen a lot of people like taking opportunities for money. I'm like, come on, dude, like you're going to try and start a delivery app and you're going to do this and you're going to do that. And I'm like, unless you're doing better stuff for the industry, like it doesn't make sense. Um, but the betterment of the industry is really a, a massive opportunity for 2021 that we can really like really take by the horns and, yeah. and make it, make a difference. Yeah. Sean, it's been such a joy to, um, to have you on uh, today's podcast, mate. So thanks so much for joining me and the audience. What is the best way that people can connect with you over all your social media because you are <laughs> feeling it, you're doing so many different things. I know everyone's going to want to speak to you after this podcast drops, especially in Canada. So um, how can they best reach out to you, my friend? Literally, if you Google, I, I actually Googled this the other day. I'm the only Sean Sewell with my spelling in the world. Wow, that's pretty cool. Yeah. So if okay. you just Google my name with S-H-A-W-N Sewell, you yeah. will find me very, very quickly. Awesome. All right. But, yeah. So look, look that up. You can hit me up on Instagram, Facebook, SA, like Sewell Hospitality Concepts on Instagram. Mm-hmm. I, I answer questions from apps. I take orders and talk to people on every platform I can possibly imagine. Um, but yeah, if you type in Google my name, you'll find, you'll find me pretty damn quickly. But <laughs> uh, yeah, you can hit me up on any platform. I'm always open on absolutely everything. I'll make sure I link that up in the show notes and um, make sure people can contact you. So, Sean. Really appreciate it, man. This is awesome. Thanks, man. Thanks for listening, Pro Shifters. I hope you enjoyed that episode. I really enjoy sitting down with friends and peers and uh, just chatting about the industry and getting down to the nuts and bolts of what's really going on out there. Uh, Make sure you like, subscribe, comment, everything on all the platforms. Just hit it up and I'll do my best to answer any queries or questions you have. I'll see you next week, guys. Bye.